Hello, hello, good evening everyone. This is I Care For Your Brain with Dr. Karen Sullivan, that's me. Board certified neuropsychologist, very happy to be your guide on this brain health education and empowerment journey. Thank you all so much for helping us reach 8,000 followers, 8,000 brain hungry learners here on our Facebook page. We are very happy to have you all here with us. Every Wednesday night, we try to gather together to have an evidence-based discussion about brain health. And tonight, we're gonna do something kind of fun, is take a step back. We can get so into our in-depth topics. I mean, we've gone into some pretty specific areas here, some, you know, rather rare stroke syndromes, some movement disorders that are, you know, relatively rare across the world. Not, not rare if you're the one who has them, of course. But often in what I do, I refer to a concept of brain health. And so recently, two articles came out in the scientific literature asking these very big questions about what is brain health. And it really got me thinking, what do I mean when I use that term? So what I wanted to do tonight was to take that inspiration from two specific journal articles and review them with you and have us put our heads together to think about what do we really mean when we talk about brain health? And even more specific, are people ready for personalized brain health? What's gonna be kind of surprising to you might be what was surprising to me, which is, you know, this is my world. This is what I do day in and day out. And if you're here with me, chances are you've been personally affected by brain health. So we think about this kind of stuff all the time. So you're going to be surprised when I go through some recent research with you uh, done on a group of folks in Europe that that surprised me. I was really surprised at what people's responses were uh, to the question of are we ready for personalized brain health? Because to me, it's a no brainer. Not only are we ready for it, but we desperately need it and to not offer it is inhumane. So the first journal article I was inspired by came out in September 2020. This was in the British Medical Journal, which has now been shortened to BMJ. And it's called What is Brain Health and Why Is It Important? And this came out of a group of Chinese neuroscientists led by a Dr. Wang. Then in September 2020, we also had an article, this one was out of the University of Oslo in Norway, led by a Dr. Friedman, called Are People Ready for Personalized Brain Health? So let's go through it together, put our brains together, and see what we can come up with. So this is not just a term I use all the time, this is a emerging trending term, brain health, right? But what's really crazy is we have no consensus for what that means. Different people mean different things when they talk about it. So some people stress definitions of cognition, right? So people thinking clearly, paying attention well, being able to make and retrieve new memories, basically a clear and active mind. While other definitions emphasize things more like healthy blood flow, uh, how it relates to the self, how the central nervous system and the self have an interrated relationship. Really very interesting stuff. So this is of course important for those of us who are brain health advocates, but beyond our little bubble here, our little circle of brain uh, health interested people, the truth is the world needs to be concerned about brain health. And as many of us know, there is a graying of America, a old, oldening of the entire world. And as we get older, the burden of neurological diseases increases because so many things are age related. So the number of people over the age of 60 and over, this is worldwide, was about 900 million in 2015. Okay, this is expected to grow to 2 billion by 2050. And as we're talking about that vulnerable group, that's just the age related conditions. We have plenty of other things that affect the brain, migraine, depression, addiction issues, movement disorders that have very little to do with, uh, with actual age. So 50 million people in the world as of two years ago, 2018, are living with dementia and we expect this number to triple to 152 million as of 2050. That's pretty significant. I think we would all agree that quality of life largely depends on the health of the brain brain and that diseases that affect the brain have pretty significant consequences for overall health and well-being. And those are just the statistics, but what I care about, what I hope you care about, is every single person behind one of those statistics, right? So for every person who lives with a brain health challenge, there's a very individual journey of suffering many times, uh, disability, 
difficulty, social isolation. And I don't mean to be negative, but I'm, I'm also realistic. And I think the truth is we have to uh, validate for people that um, when you're not affected by a brain health challenge, as the research suggests that we're gonna go over tonight, maybe it's just not something that's on your radar. So we clearly need to increase sensitivity in the culture worldwide towards people who struggle with a brain health challenge. So it's obviously vitally important all across the world, right? So about one in four adults will experience a stroke in their lifetime. This is pretty significant. So once you get above the age of 25, one in four chance you could be someone that lives with a stroke. In recent decades, governments have done more and more in terms of public health outreach for brain health, but what I hope to convince you of by the time we're done with our lecture tonight is how much more is absolutely needed. So like I was saying before, there's no current accepted, generally identified uh, description of the concept of brain health. Uh, most existing definitions are very general and they only offer perhaps one or two dimensions. So for example, the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention define brain health as the ability to perform all the mental processes of cognition, including the ability to learn, the ability to judge, to use language, and to remember. Now the American Heart Association comes out a little bit different. They say when your brain is healthy, it has the blood flow required for peak performance. Okay. The American Stroke Association says that brain health is an average performance level among all people at that age who are free of known brain or any other organ system diseases in terms of decline from function levels or have an adequacy to perform all activities that the individual wishes to undertake. Now that's wordy. And there's some jargon in there, but I think now we're starting to move more into a definition that I would personally agree with. We have to bring the individual into the conversation. And to me, it has to be brain health consistent with what the person desires, their values, their uh, feelings, their hopes, their wishes, their, their goals for relationships. Now, Dr. Wang, who was the leader of the first paper I referenced, he says brain health can be defined as the preservation of optimal brain integrity and mental and cognitive function at a given age in the absence of any brain disease that would affect normal brain function. So I think that also is coming up on accurate, but still, they still strike me as very much medical jargon terms. And you know, this is one of my motivations for doing this for three years now here offering free brain health lectures on Facebook is that I want to reduce the jargon. I want brain health to be more accessible to the everyday man and woman. And I think when we read definitions like this, I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of like, what does that mean? And it would just be so nice to have a very straightforward definition that everyone could agree on. But what we do know is that if you were to bring all the brain health challenges together, you could slice and dice them into three basic categories of brain health or brain disorder. The first one are brain diseases that have clear and measurable damage to the structure in the brain. So this would be like a stroke, a traumatic brain injury, a brain tumor. You can look at a scan and see, wow, look at that, the left frontal lobe has been injured. That's clearly a problem in the brain. But we can also have brain health issues that are maybe a little bit detectable structurally, like on a scan, but really how they affect people is in terms of function. Things like moving, thinking, feeling, behavior. So these would be things like uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and it's not to say they don't have a focus in the brain, the anatomy of the brain, but really how they affect us is through their impact on large brain networks and how they affect our cognition and our mood. So we can't forget too that things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, alcoholism, drug abuse, all of these things are brain health disorders, right? It's so easy to get judgy and to put some of those into this other category like, you know, people can control it. And of course, we believe in free will. We believe that people can exert a certain amount of control over their behavior. But the truth is we have a long way to go in terms of the public perception of the umbrella of brain health disorders. Then of course, we have the third type of neurological issue, which is no detectable function or structural issue, but they still affect the brain. So we think about things like sleep apnea, migraine. Now these get a little bit slicey and dicey because some people can have permanent 
issues in their brain related to migraine. Sometimes little white spots can show up on neuroimaging to suggest there was a small area of vascular dysfunction. We know that sleep apnea affects uh, the ability of brain cells to uh, get as much oxygen as they might need, and there could be a little bit of a decline in the function of brain cells. That's reversible with the CPAP or BiPAP treatment. But in general, we know these things affect the brain. They reduce concentration, they reduce cognition, uh, word finding, those kind of things. So where are we at in terms of brain health? Well, very few people can define it, okay, we're there. But what we really care about is, is how do people use this term and why is it important to come to a consensus on it? Well, it's really for research. It's really for uh, groups of people who are maybe across oceans from each other to be able to contribute to solving the same problem. So we might wanna just use Alzheimer's disease as an example, okay? The only treatments that we have for Alzheimer's disease today are for symptom relief, okay? And the truth is they're really not that strong. They're better than anything we have, so we prescribe them, we're enthusiastic about them. But what we're really looking for in terms of Alzheimer's is a disease-modifying intervention. So what do we mean by that? We mean something that would actually affect the physiology of the disease, what actually causes the disease, the amyloid and the tau, the plaques and tangles that build up in and around brain cells and essentially strangle them. They can't get enough nutrients, not enough oxygen and glucose, and we have cell death. So what we really need across brain injuries, brain health challenges, are interventions that actually get at the physiological brain disease that's causing the problem. I think we would all agree on that, right? So if we're struggling with defining brain health, it makes me worried a little bit that we have a little bit of a ways to go. The people who talk about brain health, even though we're having a hard time defining it, we generally do agree on six pillars of brain health. And this is what I spend a lot of my time talking about. These are physical activity, active mental engagement, a healthy diet, social interaction, quality sleep, and the control of vascular risk factors, helping your blood flow be as open and as plentiful and your blood vessels as flexible as possible. But what I want you to understand is that these are just the basics. This would help anyone. This, sometimes I joke, these things would help my cat, right? Any living being, these things, and I want you to all prioritize them. But I know that one aspect of brain health and personalized brain health is going to be personalized evaluations by neuropsychologists. And that's because we have hours and hours of looking through your medical records, evaluating you, interviewing you to determine your specific brain risks for going on to develop a dementia, any type of a cognitive impairment. So it's very, very important that we make sure that this is a widely accepted practice. And luckily in the last few years, Medicare in the United States has made it mandatory for at least once a year, folks have to get a cognitive screen. Now, do I wish it was more than just a three questions, three words, pardon me, to remember? Of course I do. I wish everybody would get a referral to a neuropsychologist. However, uh, you know, we're, we're happy that we've made inroads in this area. So alongside Medicare making some changes and people like me going out in the world and talking about the power and the helpfulness of neuropsychology, there have been a number of large scale outreach programs in several different countries around the world that promote the development of neuroscience, that talk about what to do to protect your brain. So this is more transitioning now into that other 2020 article I told you about, are people ready for personalized brain healthcare? And this is the one that kind of bummed me out. So this was a qualitative study, meaning that they sat down and just asked people some questions and then they brought together all the answers and tried to see what themes there were. So this was 44 participants from Spain, Norway, Germany, uh, and the United Kingdom. And they were really looking for people's views on brain health and what just the average person thinks about this concept of brain health, okay? So they uh, asked folks a couple different questions that we're gonna go through here together. Um, and what they were really trying to get at is, is are people happy with the one size fits all approach that we now have in brain health care, right? This is uh, not what we know as brain health doctors, brain health scientists is the best. It's not uh, the way to most 
uh, optimally prevent someone from developing dementia in terms of those modifiable risk factors, but it kind of gets the job done. We get to help the most people in the shortest amount of time. But I know a lot of people are really looking for a new approach. So when I saw this article, I was really excited uh, to read what they had to say. So of the 44 people they talked to, when they asked them about what a healthy brain was, most of them said it involves having an intact memory, uh, the ability to think, move, learn, remember, concentrate, and perform everyday activities. Someone said, someone with a healthy brain is one that's sharp, one that is functioning, and one that is aware of things going on around them. Few participants actually brought in mental health, because that's an interesting question to ask ourselves, right? Is the brain just about thinking and doing? Could it also be about a way of expressing our personhood and the, the spirit that we have, our God-given talents? Uh, someone said a healthy brain is one that works, both the emotional part and the memory part. A person with a healthy brain is able to have healthy relationships with his or her environment. And if you don't have memory, you cannot make healthy relationships with other people either. So I think what this research also gives us an in on is uh, starting to really get at people's stereotypes about people with brain health challenges. I know uh, many of you are passionate about this, am, as am I, which is uh, how personhood gets lost in dementia. And I think we're starting to see a couple of the beliefs that are behind that. Some people describe brain health as an absence of illness, pain, or any type of a brain damage. A person with a healthy brain is one with no physical pain in the brain and no apparent pain inside your brain like a headache or dizziness, okay? They asked the people how interested they were in having a healthy brain, and most of them said they didn't really think about it. It wasn't something that was on their mind. And this is what I was saying was a little concerning to me and surprising because I, I think maybe it's just the world I live in is a lot of things are about the brain and a lot of people I talk to day in and day out are focused on brain health. So it's kind of a little bit jarring to me to hear people say it's, it, they just don't necessarily think about it that much. They also ask people's willingness to learn about personal brain health. Would they be willing to undergo a test to get information about their personal risk for developing a brain disease? So the first question, they didn't say any type of a brain disease, they just said a general brain disease. So they said, you know, would you get a blood test? Would you take a genetics test? And most people said yes, they would allow this to happen, but they said they would want to know what they could do specifically to prevent it. Now, when they ask that same question, but put in the term Alzheimer's disease, whoa, 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 now the opinions are very divided. And about half of them said they thought, yes, the test would be useful to plan for the future. And the other half said they would prefer not to undergo them to avoid unnecessary worry or anxiety. So I thought that was an interesting question to pose to all of you out there with um, you know Ancestry.com and uh, what is it called, 27andMe, or there's a lot of genetic tests available now in the public market, and perhaps even for the holidays, some of you are considering getting those. Well, some of them are about your, you know, uh, cultural heritage, your, uh, your ge geographically where in the world you and your family came from, but some of them do give you your risk factors for things like Alzheimer's disease. So I would love for you all to write here in the comments, if you had a test that would definitively tell you if you were going to develop Alzheimer's disease, would you take it? Some people feel like their quality of life until they would get it uh, would be um, diminished by things like anxiety. Other people feel like maybe I'd live every day a little more full and maybe I could take some steps to minimize the impact of Alzheimer's. So I thought that was pretty interesting. They asked the participants, what do you do to maintain your brain health? And people said, I try to eat healthy, I try to be physical, and I try to be social. Some said, I try to get enough sleep. A couple people said, you know, you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't drink. And a couple people mentioned the importance of reducing stress. So it sounded like in general, people were uh, thinking correctly. But what a lot of people said is there's plenty of things they know darn well they should be doing, but they just can't seem to get it together to do it. And I know that so many of us fall in that camp. So what they talked about was what could the government do to perhaps improve brain health on more of a public health level. And so what they talked about, I thought this was very interesting, was subsidizing healthy food and perhaps putting a tax on unhealthy food similar to what they do with tobacco.
Uh, they talked about making sure that um, employees are offered work time off um, during the day to perhaps go for walks. Some people even said, you know, government sanctioned naps would take away some stigma. Um, always making sure that, uh, you know, cognitive testing, brain scans could be done at free or low cost to make people feel like they could go gather that information. Um, introducing meditation and mindfulness to children as, as that is such an important part of brain health, learning how to manage our stress. Uh, training seniors to use new technologies and making sure that access to cognitively stimulating cultural events was also free or no cost. And I thought that those were really good. I love practical things, right? Because we could sit here and talk all day long about uh, how important brain health is and, and you know everybody should be doing X, Y, and Z until it's accessible and until it's reasonable for people to adopt in their everyday life, it, it's not really something that's, that's potentially gonna change. So I thought that that was really exciting. So what's the take home message here? Many people in this study, and we assume this extrapolates to the greater society, were not really focused on brain health, didn't really consciously think about it, didn't purposefully adopt lifestyle changes to help them take care of their brain, but they were open to it and they felt like they needed more support to do it to the point of having the government come in and support it. And I thought that idea of making you know, organic, healthy, whole foods more accessible and more affordable was an awesome step. I think that is so important and is such a part of a poor diet um, you know, having been someone who has, you know, been on welfare and has been through the food stamp system, you know, as a child, I can tell you that the easier thing to do very often, especially with children, is just to get highly processed foods. Um, and, you know, in a way they taste good at the time, right? But is it necessarily the most healthy thing for that child's brain in the long run? Of course not, right? So we don't want people to suffer any more than they already have to when they are going through a time of poverty in their life. I think it is really um, important to support brain health because it dictates mental health, within, which impacts society, which impacts crime, right? There's all these different ways that we can trace back society's ills. I think back to brain health, I really do. Remember, this is where we talk about addiction, depression, these kind of things. So I thought that this really got my wheels churning about how do I define brain health? And I'm still really chewing on that because I gotta make sure I get it right, it's hard. Um, and how is it that I can continue on this mission of promoting science-based brain health, not gimmicks, uh, not tricks, not people looking to, you know, sell you a product that's going to, you know, miraculously improve your brain. We really want people to understand what does the research literature say. So this is kind of my little piece of the pie here on Facebook. So if you thought that this was interesting or if you felt like, you know what, we should be talking about this information more, then please share this lecture anywhere you can on Facebook. We really appreciate that to help get the word out. And I will be back with you again next week. Uh, we are closing out our 10 session stroke recovery group tomorrow night. If you're someone in the stroke community who would like to be with us in our final group together, that would be wonderful. You can go to our website, www.icfyb.com backslash SRG for stroke recovery group. It's $10 for about an hour and a half. And tomorrow night's lecture is about rule number 10 from the stroke recovery guide. And it's all about the transformational power of acceptance. And if you are in this community, you've heard this word, but again, until we make it accessible and practical, it doesn't mean much. We also have to really emphasize, it doesn't mean giving up. Acceptance has nothing to do with taking away from a very intense rehab program. It's really all about developing a more healthy mindset to help you recover better. So if you're inclined, I'd love to see you there tomorrow night. So thank you guys so much. I've had a very long day and I'm very excited to go have some mashed potatoes right now. That's, that's what's on my mind. So I'll see you all next time. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.